And here we can see an x-ray that clearly demonstrates what we were talking about, a very flat glenoid fossa with a very large, round humeral head. And you can virtually see how easy it would be for the humeral head to dislocate out of that because it's not being held in place by a bony congruity between those two uh, articular surfaces. Looking at uh, this x-ray just for a moment, the uh, important injuries that occur in this area that have associated um, nerve injuries, we know that the uh, ulna nerve passes right behind the medial epicondyle here, just posterior to the medial epicondyle. So if you were to see an x-ray with a medial epicondyle fracture, you would be concerned about an ulna nerve injury. We know that the median nerve crosses right like this. So this is the position of the median nerve, like that. So it's crossing right in front of this, what's called supracondylar region of the humerus. So a fracture across the supracondylar region of the humerus can injure the uh, median nerve. And we know that the radial nerve after crossing the elbow joint, sits right up against the head of the uh, radius, and so injury to the radial head can cause uh, damage to the radial nerve, radial head uh, fractures, or more commonly, radial head uh, dislocations. Now, looking at the wrist, we have an important issue to talk about with regard to wrist injuries. Looking at the sex ray of the wrist, we have... Uh, a nice representation of how force gets transferred from the hand to the forearm. And when we look at the articulation between the hand and the forearm, what we see is that the major articulation is between this bone, which is the scaphoid, and this bone, which is the lunate, with the radius. So when force is applied to the hand, such as falling on the outstretched hand, and that, for and that force has to be transmitted to the forearm, the transmission of that force is across the scaphoid and lunate to the radius. And so in the region of the wrist, the three bones most commonly injured by falling on the outstretched hand are the scaphoid, the lunate, and the radius. Those injuries will tend to fracture the radius in this position. It's called a Colley's fracture with posterior displacement of the distal fragment usually having no associated um, uh, nerve injury with it. Fracture of the scaphoid, however, is a, is a very important uh, injury. Uh, with regard to carpal bones in general, the two carpal bones that are most frequently injured are the scaphoid and the lunate, for the reasons we just talked about. But interestingly, the scaphoid tends to fracture, whereas the lunate tends to dislocate. So a fracture of the lunate has a very important clinical uh, sequelae associated with it. And it, it's a, it relates to the blood supply to the scaphoid. The blood vessels that enter the scaphoid to supply the scaphoid all enter at the distal end of the scaphoid. They come in from the distal side, which means that the proximal portion of the scaphoid receives its blood supply by way of branches of those vessels that have already entered the scaphoid and then transit the scaphoid, pass within the scaphoid to get to the proximal head. When the scaphoid fractures, it typically fractures right across its narrow waist, right across there. That's the most common fracture site for the scaphoid. So if you fracture the scaphoid across its, across its waist, that means you have separated the proximal head of the scaphoid from its blood supply, which came in from the distal end and traversed that fracture line. And so what's very important to be cognizant of is the possibility of what is called avascular necrosis of the proximal head of the scaphoid as a sequelae to scaphoid fracture. And that's why diagnosis of scaphoid fracture is important to be sure that you immobilize and approximate those ends as soon as possible after the injury in order to reestablish blood supply to try to prevent that avascular necrosis. The um, injury associated with the lunate, as I said, is uh, dislocation of the lunate. And that tends to be, again, an injury caused by falling on the outstretched hand, but more specifically a hyperextension injury to the hand, hyperextension at the wrist. Uh, 
And when the wrist is forcibly hyperextended, it tends to squeeze the lunate out of position and it displaces the lunate anteriorly, anteriorly. Which means, if we look at the next slide, here's the lunate, and here we are in cross-section, and right in front of the carpal bones, we have the carpal tunnel. There's the flexor retinaculum. And we already said that what's within that carpal tunnel is going to be the median nerve and nine tendons. So if this lunate displaces anteriorly, it's displacing into the carpal tunnel. We've already said that anything that occupies space in the carpal tunnel is apt to cause an injury to the median nerve. So a lunate dislocation is, uh, is likely to be associated with a median nerve compression in the carpal tunnel. So that concludes our uh, review of the important, clinically important uh, elements of the upper limb.